what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. Jeff, it's so great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I want to start 1997. Let's go there. And a very powerful person read your book, which was called Mutual Contempt. And this person was so moved by what you had written that he offered you a job. Can you take us back to that moment, share who that person was and what happened next? Well, that person uh, at the time was president of the United States, a uh, man named Bill Clinton. Um, I know you you know him well, and uh, we all do. And uh, I certainly did in 1997 when I went down to my mailbox uh, in, in the afternoon and, and found a cardboard backed envelope with a White House return address, which was pretty startling and thrilling. It was pretty clear to me just from looking at the envelope that it wasn't one of those fundraising letters that you get from one political party or other uh, claiming to speak on behalf of the president. So I opened it up and there was a nice little handwritten note from President Clinton um, saying that he had read my book, which was news to me and pretty thrilling, of course, and um, saying some nice things about it. And uh, I did what you expect. I, I framed it and I, <laughs> I, I told my family and friends about it. And I certainly never thought anything else was going to come of this. Uh, but indeed, a, a week or two later, I got a phone call from a guy named Michael Waldman, who was then the chief speechwriter to the president. And he said, uh, look, as you know, the president read your book. And uh, what you don't know is that we have an opening for a speechwriter. And would you like to come have lunch at the White House mess and talk to me about it? So I said, of course, and uh, went in. And Waldman and I spent about three hours together between lunch and just sitting around his office talking. And all of a sudden, this crazy thing that just fell out of the sky. This was um, this was a real possibility, and I wound up getting the job. It is a great example of you never know. You never know what can happen if you're willing to have the guts to publish your work for all to judge. I'm a big proponent, Jeff, of pushing leaders to write and to publish their writing, certainly for the people they lead, but for all, because I think it can, it can be a serendipity vehicle. And in this case, this is even before the internet was what it was, what it is today, because now there's even more opportunity for people to find you if you publish online. In this case, though, you, t you wrote a book. How do you view that, given the, the, the amazing impact it's had on your life that publishing your work can literally change your life? Well, it, it, it certainly has been the case for me uh, incredibly, and I still um, feel incredibly lucky when I think back, and uh, it's, you know, this has been 25 years now since this happened, the story that, that I've just shared with you. Um, but I will say that um, I certainly didn't write the book as part of any kind of plan, a plan. I wrote the book because I was consumed with this story. I was obsessed with this story, which you really have to be to, to write a book. I mean, you can write a book that you're not as interested in, but that's a painful process. Um, you want to love the story that you're trying to tell. You want to feel compelled to tell it. And uh, I remember sitting down in, in 1994 to work on a book proposal uh, to write this book. And I just, my, 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 my hope was that someone would just give me the chance to do this. Self-publishing at the age of 25 didn't seem like an option to me. Uh, it certainly wasn't an option to me. And so an editor somewhere in New York was going to make the decision whether I got to spend some years writing this book. And I just wanted to get this story out there. I wanted to immerse myself in it. I wanted to interview some of the participants. I wanted to see what I thought about this set of questions that I had written for myself. And so, you know, did I think anything more was was going to come from that someday? I had no idea. You can't be consumed with that question in a moment like that uh, because you can't you can't foresee it. You hope that if you do a good job at this thing and you get it out in the world, that it will begin to speak for itself and that that uh, others will read it and perhaps other opportunities will emerge. But but it has to be enough in itself 
At least it did for me in that moment. Uh, and I had another day job at the time, which was as a syndicated cartoonist. Um, and I was sort of playing in, in a way the running the same play with both of these things. I didn't know whether either of them was going to lead to anything more than what they themselves were. But that was OK with me in the moment. And when you're in your your 20s, if uh, if, if you're in a, uh, you know, not everybody is 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 as fortunate as this. I recognize that um, I sort of recognize my privilege in being able to tell a story like this. Um, I, I knew that if neither of these things worked out and I failed at both, that I could go find something else to do. And that's not a risk that everybody is in the position to take. So I felt fortunate just for that. Yeah, I, I interviewed uh, Brian Koppelman once, Jeff, and he uh, has written a bunch of movies and TV shows. And uh, Brian told me, as he gave me advice, was was to follow my obsessions and curiosity with great rigor. And that is not a guarantee of anything, but if you consistently do that, I like your odds, is what he said to me. And I remember that, and I try really hard to do that, and it feels like that's what you've built your career on. But I, were you a Rhodes Scholar before this book, or how? Do, what's the timeline there? How does this work? Yeah, I, I was. I, I graduated college in 91. I had gone to Brown, and I, I got a Rhodes Scholarship, and I was at Oxford for the next two years studying British political history. Um, and in 93, when I finished that degree, I moved to Washington. And I moved to Washington with a kind of vague plan that I was going to try to do both of these things. I wanted to launch the, the comic strip. I actually had a syndication deal that I'd gotten in college that I was able to put on ice for a couple of years while I was in grad school because I had done a comic strip for my college newspaper and for a college syndicate. So th that was part of, of plan A. And then there was the idea of trying to write this book about LBJ and RFK. But I wasn't sure I was going to do either of those things. I wasn't sure whether I was going to be able to do either of those things. So I, I got to Washington and and began to look around and 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 consider other options. Um, and I, there was another part of me that wanted to put those two things aside and just get into politics, just get into the, the new administration, the Clinton administration that had just gotten started when I moved here. And it was all very exciting. And I had a lot of friends uh, from college and grad school who had gone into the government, maybe they'd worked on the campaign. And I thought, maybe that's what I should do. That's kind of the most exciting thing happening in the United States right now. Uh, but I decided that if I didn't pursue the strip and the book at that point in my life, that I was never going to do it. Mm all day. I, I love the arc and what you've built, but I want to get into some of the meat of the things that you've written about because I think there's so many takeaways and the books are just beautifully written. Man, like talk about writer's envy. I've published a few books. I'm continually working on more. And Jeff, I read and just kind of get mad at myself. So as you probably do with some writers, uh, I forget from all. It's, it's, it, they're so, so good, man. I was rereading him this morning, but I want to jump into a passage actually from John Glenn from your most recent book. And, uh, John Glenn, fellow Ohioan, got some pride there. And I've been writing about and thinking of this concept of being a driver versus a passenger in life and the differences between a driver and a passenger and using this metaphor for how you kind of approach your career, your family, your job, everything, your friendships. And and in it when he was flying up in Friendship 7, this was a craft that was designed to fly itself. And as he was you know launched in the sky, it was it was drifting to the right. Uh, as you write like a car with its front wheels out of alignment and and John Glenn took the control stick, not without satisfaction, as you said, because he was a pilot by training and temperament and pilots take control. Can you unpack that a bit and, and humor me on this analogy about being a driver versus a passenger and the fact that John Glenn was just a straight up pilot and those, those types of people like to take control? Absolutely. In fact, um, during the NASA years, uh, there was a, uh, a senior official in NASA, a wonderful uh, man who um, I've gotten the chance to get to know, 
uh, here in the D.C. area named Robert Vos. He actually helped to select the first astronauts and helped to train the astronauts. A uh, remarkable, remarkable guy. And he told me about a study they had conducted that measuring the the heart rate and the breathing and and, and all sorts of other um, markers of stress in in pilots and uh, pilots like John Glenn are remarkably calm in the most stressful life threatening situations. But when they start to sweat, when the heart rate starts to go up, is when you make them the co pilot and they're not in control. Mm. And they are more stressed out as a co-pilot than as a pilot because they have that sense of confidence in their own ability to get out of any situation. And indeed, John Glenn had showed that throughout his career as a pilot long before he ever wound up as an astronaut. But actually, I take it even a little farther back. Uh, Glenn was very active on his own behalf. Um, and it seems funny to point that out, but there is another culture within the military, which is to simply do what you're told and to follow orders and, and to hope that if you do that effectively, that you will rise and be effective and, and so forth. But, but Glenn was very clear in his own mind, um, even as a teenager, that he was not just going to sit back and, and, and let decisions be, be made for him. He was going to do what he could sometimes a little beyond the threshold of appropriateness and trying to control his own fate and try to, uh, for example, um, he, after Pearl Harbor, he enlisted, um, uh, he enlisted in the army air force and never heard back and waited and waited. And at a certain point he thought, well, to heck with that, I'm gonna, <laughs> the Marines seem like they're gonna, you know, lead the fight. So let me go in and enlist, uh, with them. And that's how he became a, a Marine pilot. He just went to a, a different registration office. Again, not sitting back and letting fate happen to him, but taking it into his own hands. And then, uh, you know, once he'd had the pilot training, he was assigned to one of these big multi-engine planes, which uh, he and other pilots uh, referred to uh, pejoratively as a as a bus it was a sort of you know cargo plane and there was no sex appeal in that for john glenn he wanted to get out there uh and and fight um as a combat pilot and so he spent a lot of time lobbying his superiors for the for that assignment and annoyed some of them um uh, but ultimately got the got the nod and through his career he pushed uh, rather than to sit back and, and let, let fate happen to him. And uh, he never felt like he should be a passenger in, 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 in the journey of his own life. The people who make a dent in the world have a bias for action. They just do. I mean, Donald Miller talked about it on, on this podcast multiple times. It's the, I don't know if it's a victim versus hero mentality, if that's the right one. But but it, it simply is about the fact that I'm not, I liked how you put it, I'm not going to just let fate say, oh, well, whatever happens, happens. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to take action. I, when I was reading those parts about how annoyed he would get and just kept bugging him and writing letters and letters and letters, and they finally, like, dude, stop writing us letters, right? He just so badly wanted to get into the fight to say, no, I'm going to take control of this and make it happen. I think that's a that's a that's that's how you become John Glenn, and I think we can draw from that in our own lives and our own careers. Absolutely, and I think that um... – it's it was characteristic of the astronauts generally um and to come back to the the story that that you told about glenn taking the controls um when the automatic control system began to fail in in orbit uh this was a group of the best pilots that america had to offer that's why they were selected as astronauts and none of them liked the idea that they were going to be put into a capsule that essentially could fly itself that it had been designed to fly itself uh, there are a lot of reasons that it was designed that way. There was not a tremendous amount of confidence that a human being could survive the flight or could remain conscious through the flight, that all sorts of terrible things might happen to 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 uh, the pilot physiologically while in a zero gravity environment in this little little titanium bottle that they had cast him up there in. And so it was meant to, to fly automatically, and none of them liked it at all. 
Uh, they resented the hell out of it, frankly. And they consistently lobbied their superiors at NASA, the NASA managers, for more control over the flight itself. And this was a continual tension between the astronauts and the NASA managers. And it played out not just in advance of Glenn's historic orbital flight, but during the flight itself. Hmm. By the way, when you talked about the fact that the co-pilots, when they became the co-pilot and were not in control, that's when their heart rate and everything went skyrocketed. It makes me think of the difference between when I was on the field playing versus in the stands watching my children play. You know, I try to remain calm, but man, I'm not on the inside at all. But when I played, I felt like I could get to that place where I was as a quarterback. So I played, I had to be calm for my teammates and got to that place through repetition and work and, and experience. As a dad, it's like it never goes away. <laughs> you never you never get to the place where I'm calm. I'm always like, oh, I'm not in control, and I hate that. But I just got oh, let it go. And it, it, it is interesting how that works. I remember that feeling. I was never a quarterback, and uh, I was uh, never a baseball player, but my son was a baseball player. Yeah. Um. Uh. Through uh. You know. Middle school and high school and boys sitting uh sitting in those stands and being able unable to do a single thing, uh, <laughs> is uh, is a tough feeling for a parent. Yeah. Okay. I want to get into rivalry. This is a this is a big thing for me because this is a nuanced topic. I think in the books you've written, rivalry is a is a central theme and. One of the kind of core mo motivators in my life is not necessarily thinking about the doubters or the haters, as some would say, but thinking about the people who support me in my work and trying like crazy to prove those people right for supporting me. And I think there, there again, there's nuance here, but what do you think about having rivals in your life, whether it's the space program, the US and Soviet space programs, or RFK and LBJ, the fact that it seems like rivals can make you better. What's your overall thoughts on this? Well, I, I, I think about it in, in two maybe contradictory ways, because I think both things can be true. I, I think rivals can bring out the, the best in, in each other, um, but they can also bring out the, the worst in, in each other. And, and I think uh, the latter case uh, was, was uh, kind of an animating idea in my book about LBJ and RFK. Um, I think in that case, you had two incredible leaders, incredible in, in different ways and, and to some extent in, in similar ways, uh, who really could have been even greater if they had been able to join their strengths. But they mm. were so consistently at odds um, that uh, you saw on both of their behalf some of their really worst behavior um, brought out by that by that rivalry. Um, and I, I think I, I like writing about rivalries for, for a number of reasons, but I, I think most importantly, I think a, a rivalry can be clarifying. I think that as I wrote in that book, it is really impossible to understand Lyndon Johnson without understanding his relationship with Robert Kennedy and vice versa, that to see the two of them in contrast is really to understand something fundamental about how they kind of made their way through the 1960s, um, but also how they, they came to understand themselves during that period. They existed in dialogue and in competition with one another. I think when we look at the rivalry between the United States and the, the Soviet Union in, in the, the space race, uh, I, I think... Um, my answer would be would be quite different. I think that uh, it, it is absolutely the case that the the achievements of of the Soviet space program and the relentless uh, accomplishments during those early years of the Soviet space program absolutely drove the United States to think bolder and to do better. And uh, there were mistakes that were made, and and um, uh, absolutely, uh, and and yet I think uh, the United States was felt forced to compete and to find within itself. This is true of the space program. This was true of the the Kennedy administration, 
and and uh, true of all of the, the the private companies that were involved in the space program to to find something greater within themselves and and together to respond to not only to uh, Soviet achievements but to the Soviet threat as it was understood. I think that's that's something that I really uh, want to work to bring across in in my book about about John Glenn Mercury Rising is that this wasn't just a race. This wasn't the Olympics. This isn't a good natured competition. The the stakes were understood to be existential. And if the Soviets were left to do whatever they were capable of doing in, in space and the United States was unable to rise to the challenge, well, as, as JFK put it in 1960 when he was running for president, uh, the nation that, that controls space can control life here on Earth. So he saw no alternative but to compete and 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 to win. And a part of the differences between the United States and the Soviet um, space programs is, I think, this idea of failing in public versus failing in private. And it felt to me, correct me if I'm wrong here, the United States failed in public when something went bad, everybody knew it, it was all, all out there. Um, the whole world saw it. But the Soviet program seemed to be more secretive, and we didn't necessarily know what was going on. We thought they were more advanced than they were. They led us all to believe that. And it seems like us failing in public, I say us, I'm an American, failing in public was advantageous to us, while them failing in private hurt them. It, it, what what do you think about that dichotomy of the, the differences between us and them? I, I think it's a really important dichotomy. It's a really important way of looking at and understanding the space race. Um, and I think you're you're exactly right. I mean, the Soviet Union really looked like a, a juggernaut during those first several years, and was in fact a juggernaut during those first several years of the space race, because there, there were there were two elements to it. One was that when they failed, they failed uh, secretly. Um, in fact, the the location of of the Soviet uh, uh, launch platform was was not even announced publicly. The United States had some sense based on its intelligence of, of where it was, but even the location of the launches um, or the timing of the launches, all of this thing was all of these things were were kept secret. So that when there was a horrific accident, and there were horrific accidents in which astronauts lost their lives and uh, others lost their their lives on the launch pad or, or near it, uh, that the Soviets were able to to suppress that and suppress any sign of weakness. But it was also the case that they were succeeding in public. It mm. wasn't just we know as we think back, we know about Sputnik, the first satellite in 1957. We know that in 1961, it was the Soviets who sent the first human being into space, Yuri Gagarin, uh, who orbited the Earth once before returning safely. But it wasn't just those two huge achievements, which would have been huge enough in themselves. There were there was a whole series of firsts in between. They were the first to, to send a living being into space. They sent the dog, Laika, into space. They sent heavier and heavier objects into space. They sent a probe to the moon that went around the far side of the moon and took pictures. No one had ever seen what the far side of the moon looked like at that time in the late 1950s. It was one spectacular achievement after another with no sense of any setbacks. And so uh, the world was, was in awe of what the Soviets were achieving. Whereas in the United States, anytime a, a rocket exploded on the launch pad, which is something that happened a lot during those early years. Everybody saw it happen in real time. And so at, at that time, when the space program was, was defined mostly by its failures, uh, I'm not sure that most Americans, including John Kennedy, thought it was so great to be failing in public. In fact, when the United States was finally ready to send the first American into space, Alan Shepard, in, in May 1961. Kennedy thought seriously about trying to close the launch to, to the press so that if something horrific happened, it would not, in fact, be, be broadcast uh, to the world. Um, he quickly recognized that in a democracy that that was just not 
you know, with a, with a free press and and with the world's press coming um, to to witness the launch, that that was not um, something that he was even capable of doing, uh, even if he decided to do it. Uh, and so he decided to embrace it. So when this begins to benefit the United States in terms of world opinion is when we are mostly done failing in public and we begin to succeed in public. Then the the the, the world starts to uh, appreciate that the United States has taken these risks for all the world to see. Um, and the successes uh, mean that much more because uh, the, the world has recognized the the risks uh, that were undertaken and the setbacks that were overcome. You're a deep learner of history and how uh, great historical events have been achieved. And so when you live in that world of studying it and understanding how it happened and the people and the characters involved, I'd have to imagine that there's key takeaways for you as you're building your own career with a, with a family and, and, and all that goes into that. When it comes to risk, how do you approach your own career when, and making decisions and saying, oh, that's risky, I don't know. Like, how, how do you go about managing risk in your own life? Well, it's tough to to distill that to a formula. Um, I think, like a lot of people, you you sort of do this intuitively as you as you go along, and and thoughtfully, you, you hope. I I, I mean, it, I I think that I've I've tried to be thoughtful in in weighing risks and and opportunities, but not paralyzed by that set of questions. Um, and so I, you know, I, I feel like I've, I've taken some, I mean, I have to call them small risks. Ultimately, I, I guess the decision to, uh, to, to become a, a syndicated cartoonist and not to take what my parents at the time would have called a paying job, uh, was, was a, was a small risk. But again, you know, look, I don't want to overstate that. I, I, I had a good education. Um, I, I knew that if that failed, I would find something else to do. I wasn't going to be destitute. I don't want to magnify the, the kind of risks that I took there. Or in the case of coming out of the Clinton administration and deciding to start a business with a couple of my, my colleagues and friends, rather than to to join a, a business or some other kind of organization. There was a risk in that, but but again, I don't want to overstate the case because the costs of failure for me were not existential. That was part of the weighing process um, was that it, you do have to ask yourself, well, what if this fails? And, um, and, and again, I, if it had failed, I would have lost some time. I would have lost some money. I would have then gone on to to find a job somewhere else. The the the, the costs of failure in the case of the space program, um, it was it was life and death. And yeah. and and Glenn understood that, and everyone in the program understood that. And it was actually even bigger than any individual's life or death. It was America's standing in the world, and also the the. Um, the effectiveness of 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 the the uh, the U.S. Uh, nuclear deterrent and 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 other key components of our national security. If the United States continued to fail uh, on on this new frontier, uh, then it was already weakening uh, America's uh, standing in the eyes of of our allies and our adversaries, and and it was only going to get much worse. So again. I can talk about risk uh, in in my professional career, but I, I don't want to I don't yeah. want to make a big thing out of it. When you think about the people that you've studied and written about in your career, a lot of them have sustained excellence for an extended period of time. What have you found to be some of the common traits, behaviors, virtues of the people who have sustained excellence over time? I think. To come back to the the question of, of risk, I think that it is difficult to sustain excellence if your formula for doing that is to just keep doing the same thing as long as you possibly can. Uh, I think about this when it comes to political leaders uh, who evolve and question and, and change uh, as necessary um, to continue to be effective. Uh, I think about it in terms of of artists, musicians, uh, authors. Uh, I think one of the things that 
I mean, on, on one level, I'm, I'm just a, a, a fan of the Beatles, of Bob Dylan, of U2. But I think when you look at at some of the greatest uh, uh, contributions that, that any of them made, the greatest albums they ever recorded, um, they took risks. They defied their their fan base. Um, they 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 risked alienating all the people that had followed them up up to that point um, by insisting that they would continue to challenge themselves and do something different. Um, and sometimes all of them who I mentioned had had failed. But their greatest accomplishments came because of that restlessness, because of that willingness to to, in a sense, risk it all, to risk their careers, to risk their reputation, uh, to risk embarrassment. And and so I think that, again, looking at anybody in just about any field who has sustained excellence, um, that requires a kind of nimbleness and alertness to the ways in which change is required and risk is is necessary. Do you give a lot of keynote speeches? Um, I, I have over the years. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I've I've had some uh, opportunities to go out and talk uh, either about speech writing or about the books that I've written or or other things. Uh, I bring this up because early on in my sp- keynote speaking career, I was given the advice of, hey, like create your stock speech and then go out and 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 kill it a hundred times a year to just different audiences every time. And I understand that advice. It, it's good advice so that you make sure you know your stuff, you understand the timing, you know the bits, you know the transitions, you know the jokes, you got it, you know, your opener and your closer, all that stuff, right? But I found that if I don't <laughs> like try new bits or try something new throughout, so I was on a long, I was on a long stretch leading up to this moment, um, I don't feel nervous or challenged enough and in a way I have to push and try something new each time that certainly needs to apply to the audience and give them exactly what they want and still play the hits as my dad tells me right you gotta play the hits man but still do that you know what I mean and I feel like that's that I'm not trying to like be the equivalent of these people who sustain excellence but I really aspire for that and I think part of what helps me is this Ah, I'll have a phone call with my wife the night before a speech, and I'm like, I got to try a few new things here because I want to be nervous. I want to wonder if I can pull this off, and in a weird, sick way, it like keeps it fuels me up. I, I don't know if that if that if you if you sense that or you feel that. Absolutely, I I think um and look, audiences know when you're going through the motions. Yes, even if you're doing it very convincingly. Um, uh, when a speech has become stock, they they get that um they can feel it and and it, and it's because you yourself become bored by it it's wonderful if you enjoy this sort of thing and it sounds like you and i both do to stand in front of an audience and and to talk and to engage with an audience um but you lose that sense of excitement um yourself when you know exactly what you're going to say every time and it doesn't particularly vary um, on the one hand, if you're in the business of, of, of public persuasion, if you're in politics or some other field where you're you're trying to change people's minds and you're trying to lead them to a, a destination of one kind or another, um, it's important to have a, a core message and for yep. that core message to be consistent. Um, Martin Luther King, um, to, to para- paraphrase Martin Luther King, he, he said, as I travel around the country, I, I don't have but one speech. And of course, that wasn't literally the case. We all have heard, you know, many times, many speeches by by Martin Luther King. They're not all the same speech, but fundamentally, his core message did not vary much. And so I, I think that that's an important distinction to understand is that there may be a, a central story, a, 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 a core message that you want to deliver to just about every audience, but but you've got to you've got to vary the way that you do it just to keep yourself excited, engaged, challenged, and for audiences to feel that um, as you're describing. Speaking of uh, of talks, uh, you did one at Google, and um, the phrase that you used at the start was focus, purpose, and urgency. It seems that these are the keys you allude to. 
Um, can, can you talk about focus, purpose, and urgency as it relates to the program and, and why this was a, a big deal? This was what was lacking in, in the late 1950s um, uh, during the Eisenhower administration. There was certainly, obviously, in the United States in that time, enormous scientific and technological expertise. Uh, there were vast resources, human and otherwise, that could be applied to the challenge of getting objects and then ultimately human beings into space. But what was lacking in the in the program, and, and this started really at the top in the Oval Office, was a sense of focus, a sense of purpose, and a sense of urgency. Eisenhower ultimately didn't believe that space exploration was important, was worth the cost, was worth the struggle. He was interested in, in one uh, element of the program, which was uh, reconnaissance satellites. He thought that could help to prevent a uh, surprise nuclear attack on the United States. So that engaged Eisenhower. The rest of it, he thought, was non-essential at best, silly at worst. Uh, the idea of putting people in spacesuits and sending them up there to do what? He was really unclear. And, and actually, many of the advocates of human space travel were unclear uh, why they were advocating it. And so what you had in the United States uh, until the creation of NASA in 1958, which <laughs> Eisenhower did essentially under duress after S Sputnik, was multiple space programs. All the military branches, uh, other than the Marines, they had their own space program. The Army had its own space program, believe it or not. The Air Force, that's a little bit more believable. The Navy had its own space program. They were competing with one another. They were fragmenting uh, resources. Uh, they were feuding. And uh, Eisenhower just thought the whole exercise was, was wasteful. And one of the things, other than Sputnik, that convinced Eisenhower to create NASA was this uh, feeling that um, more uh, resources were being wasted through this fragmentation than by bringing it all together in a fo in a more focused effort. But it really was not until Kennedy becomes president, and really not until then the Soviets send Yuri Gagarin into space in in April 1961 that there is a a sense of urgency in the United States that this has to be a top priority, and that that was going to require a lot. Um, on, on the part of uh, the, the Congress, on the part of taxpayers, on the part of uh, the administration um, that they had not yet invested to that point. The going to the moon speech from JFK, obviously iconic, one of the most memorable speeches of all time. But privately, you write about that um, he was a little reluctant um, and, and wasn't sure if it was a good use of resources, of time and money. Can you talk more about the how he portrayed this publicly, but what he said to close advisors and to those that he worked with about his thoughts on going to the moon? He got, frankly, sort of backed into it. Um, he ran in 1960 um, partly uh, to, to close the missile gap, as he also as he often talked about, a missile gap that turned out not to exist, or if it did exist, it was to the uh, favor of the United States, but also to close the space gap. He, he insisted repeatedly that the United States could not afford to be second in space, but he had not at that point given a lot of thought as to how to become first in space. And so when he became president, he had a lot of other things to worry about. There was a lot going on in the world, a lot of uh, imminent crises, and there were problems here in the United States as well. And so he lost his focus on space, or he never really had it to that point. But again, it was the success of the Soviets, again, that forced the Americans' hand. And after Gagarin went into space, uh, Kennedy recognized that the United States really had to find, as we were just discussing, that focus, that sense of purpose, that sense of urgency. It was clear for a number of reasons, maybe too detailed to go into here, that the United States was not going to be able to catch up to the Soviets quickly. The Soviet advantage in booster rockets, the powerful thrust of their rockets, was just too great for the United States to overcome overnight. And so he began to, to search, and he really asked Lyndon Johnson to, to lead the search for uh, some sort of goal that was far enough in the future and involved enough of an investment in technology 
uh, that we might be able to leapfrog the Soviets in getting there. And for Johnson, that answer was obvious. We had to go to the moon. And he begins in the White House to steer the conversation immediately toward the moon as, as an organizing principle for the entire program. And as a goal, um, there was no guarantee that we were going to get there. There was no guarantee that if we did, that we were going to beat the Soviets, but it was conceivable. And so Kennedy makes this big announcement and asks for this huge investment of resources, uh, not just in one budget, but over the course of a decade. Um, and he wishes throughout that he didn't have to do it. Uh, and mm -hmm. he made this clear, as, as you said, to, to the advisors around him. He, he really would have rather spent that money on other things. Um, uh, but he felt that for the sake of America's national security um, and uh, for the sake of America's standing in the world and America's credibility, uh, that he had no choice. It, so thinking of this from a leadership perspective, again, not going to the moon, but just leading a company or leading a team, I think Elon had this a lot initially with SpaceX, where he just talked about Mars so much and being a multi-planetary species. He had a 100% approval rating at that time, and now it's obviously not. And I think it was because of this creating this big, audacious vision that seems l like he's going to make it a, a possible. And, and the moon seemed almost impossible when JFK said it, but we, we believed, we wanted to believe, and then we went and did it. So for leaders, what can we take from, from this big, audacious goal set years in the future for our companies to go and accomplish? Um, wh what do you think about that? And how could this put into play for someone right now who's getting ready to go into a Monday meeting and they're thinking about their next, their next quarterly town hall to say, how can I be a visionary like JFK? How can I... It, it create this excitement in my team to go after a big goal that seems like it might not be possible, but I want us, I want us to, to, to stretch for it. Well, we hear a lot about moonshots and we're very enamored of moonshots. And we're also a little bit self castigating about moonshots and that we think that we were never capable of, of coming up with, with one that is as impressive um, or ultimately as successful as the real moonshot. Um, but I think there's another aspect of this that, that we miss. So we so we focus, therefore, on setting these big audacious goals as you describe them. And yeah. so you hear a lot of that from CEOs. You hear a lot of that from presidents. Uh, but I, I think there's another aspect of Kennedy's experience in that moment, which which we tend to miss. We, we tend to to lose this piece of, of that that history. And that is that that. When Kennedy announced in May 1961 to the Congress that he wanted to send a, a man to the moon uh, and bring him safely back to Earth by the end of the decade, the public and the Congress did not just sort of fall in line or fall over with approval and, and, and excitement. There was a lot of skepticism, both in the Congress and in the country as a whole. There was a poll taken right around that time that the majority of the American people uh, was unwilling to invest the amount of money um, that it was going to take uh, to 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 get an American to the moon. Uh, did they think it was uh, an appealing idea? Sure, most of them did. But when you then ask them in the next question, um, is it worth the money? The answer generally was no. Where would you rank this in terms of other priorities? People put it pretty low on the list. And Kennedy recognized this. And so what Kennedy then understood was that if we were ever going to get there, if we were going to sustain the effort and the spending over the course of a decade to conceivably get to the moon, he was going to need to consistently communicate about it. And so that other famous speech that he gave, in fact, ultimately the more famous speech when he went to Rice University and in, uh, in Houston in, in September 1962, why, why do we go to the moon? That, that speech, um, which many of us know by heart, um, we do these things uh, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Um, part of the reason that he went to Houston and gave that speech was because he had the sense that in the Congress and in the country, that uh, the sense of excitement to the extent that it existed was flagging 
he went down there to kind of re-energize the public campaign to to get to the moon and uh, to re-energize uh, the sense of of support in in the Congress. He knew, and he was frustrated by this. He was going to have to keep working at it consistently. That was going to be his job uh, to keep the energy up, uh, to keep the sense of urgency and the sense of possibility up. And uh, so I think that that's. That's the other aspect of, of the moonshot that, that too often we, we forget because we know we know the ending of the story, right? We know we get to the moon in, in July of 1969. But Kennedy didn't know in September of 1962 that that was going to happen and didn't think it was going to happen unless he and his successors kept working to keep the public to not just to keep the public uh, behind them, but to but to actually increase the support for it in the country, which was not yet sufficient. I think relentlessly and consistently communicating that vision, if you're a leader of a team, that this is a part of all of those town halls. You you maybe kick off every one of them with whether you call it a moonshot, whatever the big goal is, so that everyone is vividly clear on where we're going, why we're going, how we're going to do it. And you almost need to get to the point where people start making fun of you as the senior leader or the CEO because you say it so much. That's when you probably know. I mean, Daniel Coyle writes about this in The Culture Code. Like That's when you know that that it, it's actually starting to hit is, is when you get to that point. Because as the person who says it, you say it a few times, you just assume everybody, oh, they already know, they know, they know. No, they don't. You have to relentlessly and consistently keep on, on message to make sure that everybody is aware and, and on board with, with the big goal. Absolutely. And, and uh, I, I, I worked for, for a long time, uh, one of our clients here at West Wing, CEO of a Fortune 50 company, and it was a mantra of his, relentlessly communicate. He was trying to drive a massive, of change, massive change in his global company, and he knew that he needed to align everyone behind this set of, of bold goals, their own version of moonshots. And so his job was to relentlessly communicate, not just to market analysts and people outside the company, but to the tens of thousands of people inside the company yep. who needed to understand the goals and be all and always be working toward them if they had any chance of of of, of possibly reaching them. So relentlessly communicate. That was his his mantra. When you were a speechwriter, I know part of uh, from talking to Cody Keenan and other speechwriters, part of uh, the job is you're studying speeches of past presidents and looking for the way they structured and what really hit and, and all of that. When you see, we, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. What a line, man. What a line. Who wrote that? Did he, like, do, you had to be constantly thinking, like, can I, can I get a line like that? Let me get a line like that one. Well, Kennedy had one of the great speechwriters, really, of, of, of all time, Ted Sorensen, and they had a great partnership. Um, because a, a great speechwriter is not just someone who sits in his or her office and, and writes wonderful things that somebody then dutifully goes out and says. It's the product of a great speechwriting is the product of a, of a, a collaboration, a partnership of a kind of mind meld um, that if you're lucky, you get to uh, you get to achieve once in a while. It doesn't happen in, in every uh, uh, speechwriting relationship. Uh, it, it's, it's actually quite rare. Um, but Kennedy and Ted Sorensen um, had had one of the the strongest, uh, most productive um, uh, mind melds of any president and any any speechwriter. Uh, it, it is some. Um, it's a strange business speechwriting um, because you are trying to sort of occupy um, someone's headspace. And, and not just to write words that that sound like them, but really over time to begin to to think like them, to anticipate how they would frame an issue, a new issue, maybe that that they haven't talked about before, haven't been confronted with before, but to do it in a way that is consistent with who they are, how they see the world, and and how they think and talk. So much there. It might be. A, a, I might need to do like a round two with you and Cody. I think it would be a cool conversation. Uh, we could. We could. We could go deep on that. One more question for you, Jeff. For someone who's a bit earlier in their career, and let's say they didn't have quite the educational exploits that you have 
had, but but they went to a pretty good school and they graduated in their in their mid twenties ish, and they want to leave a dent in the world, uh, like we've talked about. They want to do good. Uh, they want to serve. What are some general pieces of life slash career advice you'd give to that person? Well, I think I think for for many people, your twenties are a period of, of figuring out where you can make your greatest contribution. Um, it took me some time to figure it out. Maybe I'm still figuring it out. I've sort of settled on something. Was it the right answer? In most, in most ways, I, I think it has been for me. Um, but it, it, that process, it's not automatic. There's trial and error in it. Um, and not everybody, again, is, is in a position where they can afford error. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we do have to recognize that there are many people who who need to find the safest, most secure path, um, and that's going to to take priority over uh, over other ambitions. Um, but I think that uh, you know, to the extent possible, um, to test yourself uh, in your twenties um, before you settle in, before you lock in, um, to figure out again where you can make your greatest contribution and, and where you feel most vital. Um, what you find most energizing. Not everybody's going to get to do that for a living, but um, but I think that uh, it is it is absolutely worth a shot to figure out what that is and if there's a way of of making it work. Um, again, I I don't want to um, I don't want to romanticize uh, what it is that that I do or what it is that I've done. Um, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to make a living writing. It's, it's not something that's, that's possible in, in every case. Um, it's not like locking into a law firm track where you have a sense of job security and you know what you're going to get paid year in and year out. Um, there are a lot of starving writers out there. Um, uh, you know, but I wanted to, to see whether I could make that work. Um, particularly once I had, had done a number of other things and and had had gone through that process that we were talking about a minute ago of sorting out what was most exciting and what was most important to me um, and what I was best at doing or wanted to be best at doing. Well, the, the books are beautifully written. Mutual Contempt, Supreme Power, Mercury Rising. I highly recommend them. By the way, they all have two word titles. Is that intentional? You know, this was not an intentional thing. Like when, you know, people name their kids, uh, give their kids all the fir same first uh, letter uh, of their names. Um, no, it just sort of happened that way. Um, I, I, I would I would certainly depart from it. Um, I never want to uh, be formulaic, even in, in, in naming my books. Are you going to keep writing more? I absolutely intend to. It's, it's what I, I love doing most. And um, uh, there's just nothing like being able to invest yourself in a story, immerse yourself in a story and, um, uh, and, and, and sort out how best to tell it and why you think it's worth telling. Um, I, I, I love that work. I, I love all the elements of it, the research, the writing, and then the going out and talking about it. Um, it, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all, um, incredibly gratifying to me and, and it's been especially gratifying to find, that other people respond to these these stories. That what excited you about this story when you first began to explore it excites others who are maybe encountering it for the first time. What would be the next topic, or is there already one selected? There isn't. I've got to spend yeah. some more time thinking about it. As, as yeah. I said at the beginning would of you, your conversation, would you, since before we recorded, I, I apologize for cutting you off. Would you do one on the Beatles? You know, if if there weren't already a brilliant series being written about the Beatles right now, I would I would feel sorely tempted to do it. But mm. but there's a there's an author maybe you know Mark Lewison, um, who is in the process of he's writing the second volume now of a massive trilogy on the Beatles. Um, he is giving a, a Robert Caro treatment to wow. the Beatles. That is the level of of research that he's done and. Um, uh, it's extraordinary. Um, uh, it's an extraordinary achievement. Even if, even if you're not a fan, just simply, and I am, uh, uh, certainly a fan, 
it's a, it's an incredible work of history and um i'm getting very impatient waiting for for volume two gotcha well i'm excited to see what you choose to to dive into next and and, and how you follow your curiosity and obsessions with great rigor I'm, I'm one of the benefactors among millions of others so thank you so much again the books mutual contempt supreme power mercury rising so good man thank you so much jeff for being here and i would love to continue our dialogue as we both progress man thank you ryan it's great great talking with you and i'd be delighted to continue the conversation anytime awesome thanks so much man thank you